Good morning, everybody. Welcome to From the Deep End. This May the 3rd of 2022. What a great day to be here with you today and to spend a couple of hours this morning uh, studying the Word of God together. Um, just appreciative of y'all's uh, tuning in and being a part of the program today. Um, this morning, we will <clears throat> do our normal routine. We'll have a, an hour here of uh, some Bible questions and answers. Got two or three left on the table from the uh, last couple of days. Um, and uh, we'll try to deal with those as we can. Um, and if, if we have time, we'll uh, work in any others that may come up during the day as well. Always try to keep track of the backlog of questions that we have because there may come a day when y'all actually don't give me uh, some questions. So I always want to have uh, some in my pocket and, and have something to talk about, even if you don't. Um, and then, of course, in the second hour of the program, we will turn our attention back to the book of Romans. We will be starting uh, chapter 13 today. Uh, and what an appropriate day to be starting chapter 13, talking about the Christian relating to government authorities. I am assuming you have um, heard by now uh, the uh, the news that broke last night about the uh, reported leak that came out of the uh, um, Supreme Court, which that's a different topic. That That's that's not good. That's not supposed to happen. Um, but um, um I have my own thoughts about why that leak might have happened. Not any different than a lot of people's thoughts, but that's not really the point. Let's just hope that the news that broke uh, is actually true uh, and that the five justices that apparently have decided to uh, uh, overturn Roe v. Wade and um, uh, what's the other case, Casey, I believe, uh, and um, um, send it back to the states and state legislatures to begin making some more localized decisions about that. Let's pray that that uh, uh, continues to be true and that uh, that leak is actually uh, the reality. I know the, I was watching some of the reporting on it last night and uh, there's one reporter that was live streaming from out in front of the Supreme Court and it was not uh, not necessarily the, the nicest place to be. Lots of, uh, going to be a lot of heated, heated uh, protests and heated discussions about all of those things and uh, let's certainly pray for for peace to it to to uh, to uh, have sway in the land over these things. But I could see this going in a in a real bad real bad direction in a lot of ways. But thankful for the outcome um, that does I think enjoin upon us as individuals now. Um, you know, as we'll get in the second hour of the program, uh, I do think there's that, the American concept of separation of church and state is probably not uh, far from a biblical standpoint. Uh, a biblical construct, uh, certainly on the church's side. We are not a political organization. We are not a civic organization. We are a spiritual organization. But um, we are individuals. We are citizens with, under the, uh, in this land. And if we want to, some of the atrocities that have been going on in this land, and, and this does send back, get sent back to the states, um, we now actually have some, we have some voice in the matter. Um, and I would certainly enc encourage all people of faith to um, um, make our voices heard and stand where, where we know we should stand on this matter. This is not one that needs to be political. Uh, this one's pretty cut and dry. If you are, if you are a Bible believer, it's a pretty cut and dry case. Um, if, if it's not a cut and dry case to you, I start having to question your understanding of God, understanding of humanity. I, I have some real questions for you if this one's not cut and dry. So um, anyway, thankful for the, for the, for the news. Hopefully, um, as I said, peace will prevail in our land uh, and, and things will not get too bad here. And hopefully the uh, the justices will stick to their guns and not allow any political pressure to uh, dissuade them before the final decision is is reached and announced. But uh, at least the preliminary news is, uh, is very encouraging. Uh, it's a battle that's been raging well, most of my life. I was born in 71. I think Roe v. Wade was um, 74. Um, so it, it's been essentially all of my life. Uh, that this this battle has been going on, and we're thankful for uh, at least it appears to be some kind of a good move, move movement on that on that regard. So keep it in your prayers. I know you will. And if we get the opportunity to have an impact in our states, I would suggest we uh, we stand up and and we we let our voices voices be heard on the matter. Anyway, uh, that's my cultural commentary for today. Let's turn our attention back to. Um, the question that we had in front of us, um, 
I don't have it typed in again, but Sherry asked a couple days ago. Uh, she actually, I think she actually asked it last Wednesday, and then we weren't here Thursday. Um, and then we spent Monday talking about it, and we're going to try and finish it up today. Uh, unless I get long-winded, I don't think it'll take the whole hour today to finish up what I want to say. But I, and I'll do my best not to get long-winded on it. Um, talking about the 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 what kind of power does Satan have in the world today? I started by talking about... Um, what I believe is is critical to to, to get uh, in terms of understanding the um, um, structure of the New Testament around the work of Satan, and it's something that I don't think we talk about enough, is that there are two very clear images of Satan in the New Testament. One, he's free. Uh, he is walking around. He's thwarting the plans of God on every side. And by the time you get to the end of the book of Revelation, for a thousand years, he's bound in a bottomless pit. Uh, you know, First Peter five eight and uh, revelation 20 and verse four we only read it like six times last yesterday why why would i remember where that verse is um no oh, later than that um no oh, where is it there uh, not four uh in three in the three um verse three show two different images of satan one is bound, one is loose, uh, and th that needs to be understood. Secondly, uh, the point we made is that the New Testament does describe the limitation of sa Satan's power. That limitation is connected to the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Hebrews 2.14, um, that um, uh, he would render him idle, and 1 John 3.8, that uh, Jesus would loose the works of the devil. Both of those seemingly tied to the death, burial, and resurrection. He, Hebrews is clearly tied to it. It's exactly what the verse says. Um, I don't think it's a stretch to say that that rendering idle and that loosing of the um, the works of Satan um, coincides with um, the the binding of a thousand years. Now, I suppose there's probably some other construct that you could consider to, to, um, to understand that. Um, but again, I, I try my best not to complicate matters. If, if I have a statement that he's going to be limited in some way in Hebrews and first John, and then I see that described in revelation 20, I'm saying, you know, those things probably go together until somebody shows me why they don't go together in my book, they go together. Um, the only description I know of, uh, about, about what it means for him to be, Old King James rendering of Hebrews 2.14 is destroyed. Doesn't mean annihilated. It means to be to become useless, ineffective, um, or his works being loosed. The only descriptive phrase of what that means is there in, in, in Revelation 20, verse number three, that he should go and deceive the nations no longer. The point I made yesterday is I don't necessarily know what that means. I don't. Uh, what I do know is it means something. There is some limitation of the power of Satan during that thousand years. I personally believe we live in the thousand years now. Other people have other ideas about when that thousand years are. Um, but that's the reason. Um, that's that's the reason uh, that, that I would say that. Now, I do believe further that that has some kind of impact in our world. We looked at Romans 16, I believe, verse number 20, where the Bible says that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Again, I do not believe crush here means annihilated, destroyed, so that he no longer exists. But there is, again, some um, uh, defeat, crushing of Satan. And God says to the Romans, uh, through Paul, that it would that God would do that under the feet of the saints, particularly the Roman saints. Um, so, assuming that can that that thought in Romans can be generalized out to other Christians, which I think it can be, um, there is a a um, a um, an effect to his limitation. There's some benefit that comes to the saints based on that limitation. That's the metaphor there. Under the feet of the saints, Satan, his power would not would not have free reign. Let me just say it that way. Again, what does that mean? I don't know. 
I don't know. And so don't come out of here saying, well, Jonathan doesn't believe in Satan or Jonathan doesn't believe Satan is in the world. Jonathan believes that he, during the thousand years, he cannot deceive the nations any longer. And soon after the writing of the book of Romans, Satan was crushed under their feet because that's what the text says. Okay. That's what the text says. That's all I know. All right. So that's what we, that's what we talked about yesterday. Um, Deborah asked, um, is the, um, Thousand years figurative, I believe it is, Dever. I, I think it is. Um, because whether, yes, I mentioned this briefly yesterday, but I'll touch on it here before we move on to the other stuff. Um, inside the <clears throat> inside the church, um, two main views about the book of Revelation. One, it's about Jerusalem. The second one, it's about Rome. If it's about, if it's about uh, Jerusalem and the thousand years begins at the end of that age, then if it's literal, the thousand years would have been up in the year A.D. 1070. If it's about Rome, the latest date you can apply to the church at Rome uh, or to the to the Roman Empire would be AD 476 when the city of Rome falls, which then the thousand years would have been up in roughly AD 1476. Um, I don't see any particular significance to either of those dates in terms of biblical chronology. So we are well outside, no matter which view you take, uh, we are well outside the thousand years now if the thousand years is literal. So that leads me to the only conclusion I can come to is that the thousand years is figurative. Now, premillennialism believes that the thousand years is literal and still yet in our future. Um, different topic, different day, but I would reject that just kind of out of hand because uh, I don't believe in premillennialism. So I, I, I have no other clues, the conclusion to go to than the thousand years is a long, indefinite period of time which um, encompasses essentially all of the, what we would refer to as the Christian age. Okay, that, that would be my view of it. So I say all that just to bring us up to speed where we were yesterday as quickly as I can. I made the point in closing that I don't think that's actually the discussion we need to be having. The second part of Sherry's question was, if I remember correctly, she asked, can the devil make us sin? Um, uh, quoted, or at least alluded to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26, which seems to suggest that people have been taken captive by Satan and so on. Um, but I don't believe that. For, obviously, that does happen. People become part of his, if you will, kingdom. And, and that absolutely happens. Um, but can he make that happen? And there's the point I want to camp on. Because no matter what you think about all of the kind of the, the textual things that we were talking about, some of it quite speculative. Uh, a lot of it, very good brethren have different ideas about, and, and I'm not trying to start any arguments with any of them. Um, you know, so long as the guy's trying to be textual, I'll listen to anybody's perspective on the matter. But I think part of our problem, maybe the largest part of our problem, actually comes from the fact that we have a misunderstanding of Satan from the beginning. Um, my good friend Eric preached a sermon one time. I can't remember the title of it, but the phrase he kept using in the term, in the in the term, in the, in the in the sermon rather was, um, "There is no versus." You know, when when one team plays another, it's 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 Alabama versus Auburn. It's uh, the Yankees versus the Red Sox. Which, anytime you use that versus, there's a competition going on, right? There's a battle going on. There's a there's a a a, a, a game going on, and that and and uh, it purportedly that game. Could have an outcome, you know, in any given any given Saturday, one team can beat another, any team can beat another team. There's a possibility that either side could win. And his point in the sermon, which was, I thought was a, a great sermon, his point was, there is no versus. This is not God versus Satan. There was never a moment in all of human history, in all of eternity, there was never a moment when Satan had an opportunity to win. The only person that didn't know that was Satan. Okay, God knew it. There was never any doubt that Satan was going to lose this battle because it really wasn't a battle. It was it was a single ant crawling along the tabletop uh, and, and it's just a matter of when you put your thumb down to end it, end it. Now, if you are in the middle of doing something and that ant just crawls up your arm and starts biting, it's going to, it's going to sting. But there's no chance that ant is going to win. At some point, when you're ready to, you're going to kill the ant. There's no verses here. Satan is not some kind of demigod who is on the uh, on the level of God. He's just not, not even close. 
Now he's higher than we are. He's more powerful than we are, but he's not. Uh, he's not more powerful than God. Um, you know the um, the the text in Daniel talks about um, some of the conflict between Satan and the angels of God. That 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 might be closer, but now you're dealing with not God, but an angel of God. Uh, there was a contention over the body of Moses, um, and so on. There. Uh, some of those conflicts are there, but um, they weren't with God. When God stepped in, they ended. Okay. Secondly, so Satan is not, he, he is not divine, not nearly divine. And since he is not divine, he does not have divine characteristics. He's not omniscient. He is not omnipotent. Uh, he is not omnipresent. He's none of those things. Um, Look at how many times he's wrong when he appears in the Bible. Look at how many times he fails. Uh, obviously, he succeeds in the garden, and that's that's our starting point. We think, okay, there he is, right? What happens after that? When's the next time you come across him in your Bible? Strangely enough, Satan doesn't appear in the Old Testament that often. Um, he's there in the garden. Um, he is there in um, uh, the time of Job. And what does he do with Job? Well, he fails. He's wrong. The whole time, he's wrong. He says, if you do this to Job, he'll curse you. He was wrong about that. If you do this other thing to Job, if you afflict his body, he'll curse you. He was wrong about that. Uh, you see him again in the uh, book of Zechariah, um, about the uh, dealing with the high priest there in, what's it, Zechariah uh, 2 or 3. Um, again, ineffective there. Uh, you see him in the in the, the temptation of Jesus. Ineffective there. And so on. It's amazing how often he appears in Scripture and he fails. He doesn't know. He doesn't, you know, it, for John chapter 3 says, the light shone into the darkness and the darkness understood it not. He doesn't understand the plans of God. He doesn't understand why people serve God. He doesn't know because he's evil. And darkness does not comprehend light. They don't get it. They don't understand it. So he's not omniscient. He was wrong about the heart of Job. He was wrong about what would tempt Jesus. He's not omnipotent. He does not have the power to make somebody do something. In fact, before he attacked Job, he had to get permission from God to make use of whatever power he had to impact the physical world. When you actually take time to look at him in the text, what power does he exert when he appears? What power does he exert over Eve? Words. He talks to her. Words. Okay. Now, he has, he's granted power to impact the world um, with the, the, the calamities that he brought upon Job's family, calamities that he brought into the world. So, yeah, when God permits it, he has the power to do that. But does he have the power, again, to impact Job spiritually? Nope. All he, all he is is granted the power to impact the world physically. And I take great, great com or great confidence in the thought that he has to ask for permission to do that. That does not seem to be the normative case of the work of Satan. That seems to be the exceptional case of the work of Satan. When um, he comes to Jesus in his temptation, what power does Satan exert? Words. Just words. That's all he has. That's all he uses. He tries to he tries to tempt Jesus with 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 false reasoning. You have Job. I'll grant you Job. Actually, read the, the other times that Satan is present and actively working in the world, and you tell me, just from the biblical text, what power does Satan exert in the world? Just words.
that's about it. Now, words are powerful, and Satan's powerful. Not, not, not disputing that, not denying that at all. But we have, I believe, a very mysticized of, of, of feeling about Satan. I believe a lot of our understanding about Satan comes from uh, classical literature and, in our age today, pop culture. I mentioned it yesterday in the class that we have this view that Satan is the Lord of, of hell. Just like um, uh, Hades is the, uh, was it, is Hades Greek or Roman? Uh, but the God of the underworld, that's effectively Satan. He's the God of the underworld. No, he's not. When the end, end comes and we know definitively that Satan is cast into hell, cast into t- to Taurus, bound in chains for the judgment, Second Peter chapter 2, for the place prepared for the devil and his angels. At whatever point you know that to be true, you need to understand something. Satan is not down there just relishing in the, in the warmth getting getting a suntan and, and a, you know, a fire tan and enjoying it. No. Satan is going to hate it as much as any person that ends up there. This, 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 this um, um, popular belief that there are two sides to this issue. There's good and there's an almost equal influence uh, uh, to the, to the downside of bad and that the, the, the 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 evil side of the ledger is 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 either just as strong or nearly as strong maybe in some cases stronger than the good side that there's an equal contest going on for our souls is not biblical there is not again not to say that he is there is nothing there obviously there is something there there's there 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 is a uh, purportedly an angelic being that is after the souls of humanity. That is not insignificant. It is not. One angel of the Lord went through the camp of the Assyrians outside of uh, uh, Jerusalem in the days of Hezekiah, and one angel of the Lord in one night killed 185,000 men. That is not insignificant. If that's your enemy, you'd better be aware. Okay? You'd better be aware. But God does not allow Satan to exercise that kind of power. He never has. The only example we have of it is Job. I take from Revelation chapter 12, when the salvation and the power and the kingdom and the authority come, the the accuser of our brethren, which had been before the throne of God, accusing them day and night, is cast down, and so therefore no longer able to do such. It is my personal belief that you, you have insight into what Revelation 12 is talking about, as we looked at it yesterday. He's night and day before the throne of God, making accusations against the brethren. Tell me that's not exactly what he's doing in the book of Job. He's making accusations against Job and really about God, ultimately. That's exactly what he's doing. And God, to defend his own righteousness on some level, listens to him. Okay, let's have this contest. Let's see. He already knows what Job's going to do. He's God. Satan doesn't. Satan thinks he's got a fighting chance here. God knew Job. If the, 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 he knew what was going to happen. Okay. I don't believe that happens any longer. I do not believe, based upon Revelation chapter 12, I do not believe that Satan has the ability to go before the throne of God and say, um, hey, God, let's have a conversation about Jonathan. I don't. I don't believe that's happening. Um, That's the blessing of the gospel. Now, that is is that tied to his binding in Revelation chapter twenty? Probably so. I you know I don't know. Um, But I I do believe Revelation chapter twelve is 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 active in our world today when it comes to those things. So what do we have? We have a very powerful angelic being who, from day one, operated still under the constraint and the authority of God. He's not allowed free reign. He's not allowed free reign. He does not know what is in your mind. He did not understand what was in Job's mind. 
He did not understand what was in the mind of Jesus when he tried there. He does not know. Your thoughts are your own. When I was a young preacher, I used to preach it that way. I said, if, if Satan has a, if you have a weakness, Satan knows what it is and he'll find it and he'll use it against you. No, he doesn't. Not unless you demonstrate it. Not unless you speak about it. Not unless you show it. Okay. And he's not omnipresent. He's not omnipotent, uh, 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 omniscient. You know, you don't wake up in the morning and have Satan at your doorstep every day. When asked in the book of Job, where have you been? He says, walking up and down through the earth. Meaning he's walking, or he's, I mean, I'm sure he does it faster than we do. But if he's walking up through the earth and you live down through the earth, he's over there and you're over here. And there's one of him and seven, eight billion of us. I'm saying, we have this idea that every day when we wake up, we have a personal adversary who is after us individually, right? That's what we think. That's not the case. Satan is not actually our adversary. We are pawns in the game. Satan is not actually after us. Satan's after God. He wants God's throne. All right. Now he may use us to try to dethrone God, but we're not the end game for him. He's after the throne of God. He's actually God's enemy, not ours. I'm not sure he pays that much attention to us on a daily basis. Not unless he thinks somehow it's going to thwart the plans of God. I just don't know that I'm that important. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipresent. There are going to be times in your life where he, 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 depending on you know what you do with him, there might be times in your life when he's paying attention to you. I suspect there are many, many more larger periods of time when he isn't. Again, he's not actually in the Bible that much. Most of the things that go wrong throughout Israel's history go wrong because Israel is a stubborn and rebellious people. Satan didn't do anything because he didn't have to. Or at least we're not told of his doing anything because it was not relevant. Israel was stubborn. They did it. So he's not omni omni he does not omniscient. He does not know what is in your brain unless you express it. He is not omnipresent. He is not always at your doorstep. Now, how many people can he impact in a day? I don't know. You tell me the limit of the 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 power, the reach of an angelic of, of an angel of God. I'll give you a better clue. I have no idea. Uh, if, if you can find the Bible verse that tells me how many people an angel can deal with in a day, I'll let you have an idea. Assuming, assuming Satan is some kind of angelic being, I'd have a better understanding of it. But I don't know. I just know he's not omnipresent. And I know he's not omniscient. He does not know everything going on in the world all the time like God does. He doesn't. Never has. And he is also, not, not only is he not omniscient, and not only is he not omnipresent, he is not om omnipotent. He does not have the power to do all things. And as such, he does not have the power to override your free moral agency. He never has. He always has to deceive, to lie, to tempt. James chapter 1 is still operative. Every man is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. That is not has nothing to do with Satan. And your lust operates whether Satan is present, active, and active in your life or whether he is not. If you're a man who likes to look at pretty women and there's a pretty woman at the office, Satan doesn't need to do anything to get you to look at that pretty woman and lust after her. He doesn't have to do a thing. You'll do that whether he's there or not. Okay? And if you ch if you choose to begin to uh, 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 think of that person differently, you know, control, act, act differently around that person, there's nothing Satan can do. That is, is going to cause you to have a temptation over her. Don't believe that's the way it works at all. I don't think that's ever worked that way in Scripture. Okay? And if, 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 she is a, if she is an honorable and wholesome woman, she's not going to act or dress provocatively to a woman who is not her husband. 
And if she's an evil woman, she will. And I don't know that Satan has to do anything to make her act that way. So he spoke in words. That's what, he spoke in words when he tried to tempt people. And that, that's what I have. So um, my issue is not about his limitation. My issue is on the front end. I, I believe we have a much uh, a, a secularized, pop culturalized, if that's a if that's a phrase, view of Satan to begin with. And we get him wrong on the front end. Now, please understand, I'm not trying to diminish the work of Satan at all. As, as I've already said, he's at least an angelic being. Uh, unless he's some kind of you know life form of his own, uh, he's not God. He's not man. He's not. He's not a beast of the field. The only thing left are some kind of heavenly or angelic type beings. That's the only other life that we're told about in Scripture. So that on some level, that's what he is. Okay, and those beings are powerful, much more powerful than we are. And if we were ever to end up in a direct contest with Satan, having some help from God would be a wonderful thing. Absolutely. However, even if we do end up in a direct conflict with him, we have the whole armor of God that we can stand against the wiles of the devil, Ephesians chapter 6. Is it 2 Corinthians where Paul says, we are not ignorant of his devices. We know what he does. We know how he acts. Okay, we know what he wants. James says very clearly, if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. Dangerous enemy, yes. But if you're careful with them, you have the tools you need to handle them. And that's always the case. That was always the case, no matter the current state of his, of his power. Add to that, there is clearly a period of time in Scripture when his power is at least somewhat limited described by the biblical phrase that he cannot deceive the nations any longer. I don't know what that means. What I'm trying to get you to see here is, again, if you take away from this that Don Jonathan is out here teaching that the, the devil doesn't exist and that he's not doing anything, that is not what I said. If that, if that is what you took out of the last day and a half or so, you've missed the point of, of this lesson. Um... um he is at least an angelic being, and they have, an, they have an immense amount of power when they are permitted to use it. But it is not divine power. Never has been, never will be. And so because it is not divine power, and it does not have the ability to override our own choices, the path to defeating Satan is to simply do what's right. Do not be drawn away of your own lust and enticed. Resist the devil. Humble yourself in the mind before, the, before God, and he will lift you up. Do all the things that Scripture has told you to do. Don't wake up every morning worried about what Satan is going to do because you already have the answer. If you go out and do what's right and take care of your own business, Satan has no power over you. None. And when you mess up, own it. Don't start looking around and saying, well, if, if Satan weren't on me so bad, I wouldn't have done that. I don't think that's true. Satan did tempt Eve with the fruit. He did. What if he hadn't? What if he hadn't? See, I'm of the conviction that even if he hadn't, he may have sped the process along. But I'm of the conviction that um, if Eve had looked at that fruit the same way, when she looked at the fruit and saw that it was good to the eyes, good for food, able to make one wise, I'm not, I'm not certain she doesn't come to that conclusion on her own at some point. Every man's tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. Satan hurries up the process. Satan puts the thought in her head by deceiving her. Think, think it's possible. She gets there on her own. Can't prove that. Don't know it. Speculative. Don't know it. But I know it's at least possible. Because we're tempted by our own lust. Which means that lust was in her. Satan didn't put the lust there. It was in her. 
because that's how you are tempted. Your own lust is what causes you to be drawn away. So if you can control your lust, if you can do that transformate transformative, uh, live that transformed life that we've been talking about throughout the, our study of Romans, if you can do that, you have a chance to stand against the devil, whether he's on you or not. So I hope that helps some. Uh, uh, we have more more power, in, as, as I think Melissa says, we have control over what we do. We have more control uh, over the events of our lives and our dealings with Satan and our devotion to God than we than we give credit for. So there is an adversary. He is powerful. He's not God. He does not have control of your life. You have the ability to resist him. And when you resist, he'll flee. The armor of God that you wear, assuming it is a full set of armor, is sufficient to defeat him in, in all, of his, all of his appearances. All Jesus did was quote God's word. If you, if you replicate what Jesus did, you will defeat Satan just as Jesus did. You will. And now you have the added benefit that on some level, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus has in some way further limited the power of Satan. I take that as a good thing. So I hope that helps. Uh, there's a lot of speculative type stuff, and there's a lot of times I said I don't know. But um, I, I hope you'll take that and consider it, and we can uh, we can get that. Um, Nakia put in a couple of super chats, and I'll, I'll try to bump those to the top of the list here. Um, she says, um, the phrase I hear Christians often say is Satan is busy. Uh, could you address this? Sounds like putting all accountability uh, she follows that up with another one, uh, pulling all accountability on Satan. I, I don't know if I, I don't know if I know what they mean when they say that, Nikki. I really don't. Um, um, you know, I think it gets back to that maybe that thought I was talking about just a few minutes ago. That we we personalize Satan, and that we we believe we have a personal enemy on Satan. That when we as soon as our feet touch the floor in the morning, Satan is right there on us and he's busy in our lives and he's trying to trip us up and, and so on. Um, and I don't, I, I don't get, I don't get that sense from scripture at any point in scripture. Um, he's there in the garden with Adam and Eve because he's, he, he's, I mean, obviously he wants to, to destroy Adam and Eve. Sure. But that's not actually what he wants to do is God's made this beautiful world, and he's a, he's after God. He's after the throne of God. He doesn't. He's not actually after Adam and Eve. If you read the story of the garden and think what what Satan is trying to do is get Eve to sin so he can have Eve in hell with him, no, Satan doesn't want to be in hell. See, there's that pop culture thought again. We have Satan wanting to rule over hell. He doesn't. He says to Jesus, all the kingdoms of the world are mine. Okay, the answer to that is actually, no, they aren't. Revelation eleven fifteen says the kingdoms of this world are now the kingdoms of our Christ. When Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection are done and the church is expands through the world, the kingdoms of the world don't belong to Satan. God is king of kings and Lord of lords. I know in a practical sense, he is the ruler of the world, the prince of this world. I get it. Scripture does say that. But this is God's creation, not Satan's. Satan wants to rule the world. That's God's, that's God's realm. That's God's domain. And ultimately, he wants to dethrone God. And we personalize him after, as if Satan is after us. I don't see that in Scripture anywhere. Uh, which is not to say that he doesn't devour the saints of God. First Peter 5, 8, he does, but not as an end. The end is not to have his collection of, of, of condemned souls in hell with him. I'll say it again. He doesn't want to be in hell. Hell is designed for him. If the, if the infinite mind of God designed, if you will, a torture chamber to torture just you, do you think that's a place you want to end up? No. I'm going to guess if God personally designed a chamber to torture me, 
that is going to stink. That's going to really be bad because he knows everything. He knows everything. He doesn't want to be there. Okay, he's not trying to collect souls in hell with him. He doesn't want to be in hell. And I, I think we have that that's pop culture theology that we have him as the ruler of hell. He doesn't want to be there. And when he ends up there permanently and forever, he's going to be in pain and he's going to be tortured and he's going to be one of those souls down there, if you will, not that he has a soul, but he's going to be one of those beings down there crying out in pain just like everybody else. He's after God, and he will use us and destroy us as necessary to get to God. But he's not waking you up on uh, or meeting you at the front door on Tuesday at 8 o'clock because, okay, today's Nakia's day. I'm going to follow her around all day and make her life miserable today just for the sake of making Nakia's life miserable today. That's not biblical. That There's no indication that that's what the Bible does. He goes after particular people goes after Adam and Eve, goes after the most righteous man in the world that even God brings him up, if I'm not mistaken, in the book of Job. He wants Peter. Satan desired to sift you, has desired you to sift you like wheat. Why, Peter? Oh, oh, that's right. One of the apostles. Like that might be a good get for him because he got one of them. Satan entered the heart of Judas and he caused Judas to betray the Christ. Huh. Wonder why he wanted Judas. Why did he want Judas, one of the twelve apostles, and not, you know, uh, Thomas over there in in Caesarea Philippi, who's herding a group of sheep, shepherding a group of she flock of sheep? Why does he want Judas? Well, because Judas is one of the twelve for Jesus, and if I can get if I can get Judas, I've got an end to get Jesus. He was after Jesus, not Judas. Judas was an end, a means to the end. The end was Jesus. He wanted to kill Jesus, not Judas. We lose sight of that. He wants Peter because Peter's with Jesus. If I take Peter, it hurts Jesus. We, we make it a personal enemy, and I don't believe that's right. And so I think that's what people have, this mentality that Satan is busy meaning that he's on me today. And, and I, don't, I don't see that in scripture. Now, that is not to deny the possibility that he could be on you because he was on Peter and he was on Judas and he was on Job and he was on Adam and Eve and, and so on. Not denying the possibility of it. But conceptually, we have this being wrong. We, we, we act as if he is the harvester of souls so that he can populate his kingdom of hell. And that's just not biblical. Never has been. He doesn't want to be there. He wants heaven not hell. In his world, if he could throw if he could throw God down into hell, he would. That's what he wants. Okay. Um so let's see anything else on there because I got about 10 12 minutes left. Um um let me scroll back up here. Um I need to get to Travis's question if I can. Um Jonathan's not Bible related. Have you ever thought about storm chasing? No, not really. No, um, not, not we're going to do that. Um, Edith's got a question on there, but I need to get to Travis's because that's uh, um, that's been on us for a while. Um, um, yep, yeah, let me just go ahead and get to Travis's question. Uh, first John 5, 7, and 8. Um, what are the spirit, water, and blood in verse number eight? Um, I'll go ahead and pull that up real fast here. Um, there it is. It's not one I have a great deal of insight for you, Travis. Um, it's not one I've thought about a lot. Of course, I uh, don't really have time to get into it. There is a very much a textual variant here in in First John five seven and eight. Um, does the ESV give a footnote on that somewhere? I thought it did. Um, I don't see it. Does the uh, New King James do it? Um, 
Yeah, I don't know if y'all can read that. I can never tell what y'all can read and what you can't on the screen. Uh, the uh, New King James says the N-U and the M, uh, which would be the, uh, um, I, I can't remember what version of the um, critical text that uh, uh, the, the um, New King James references. It's in the preface. I don't remember what edition of it it is, but uh, N-U stands for the, uh, it's, it's called the critical text. It, it, it's the... Um, uh, critical text, meaning uh, textual criticism has been applied to the, all the different manuscripts. Uh, United Bible Society, Nestle Alon text. It would go back far enough the people that started this, a couple of men, couple of men called Westcott and Hort. Uh, it's the text that comes out of that family. Um, way outside the discussion today, M, uh, I believe in the New King James, simply stands for the majority text, which is what the, most of the manuscripts say, and that's how you come to that text. But they omit from in heaven in verse seven through on earth in verse eight. And it says only four or five very late manuscripts contain these words in Greek. So the old King James, which is taken from the received text, has um, a longer um, verse here um, than the newer translations. Uh, in, in fact, verse seven is largely missing. And that's what that footnote says. Verse 7 is largely missing. So from in heaven down to on earth is missing in most of the manuscripts that we have. So when you read this verse in newer translations, it reads differently than it does in the King James. In fact, in order to keep the, the verse breakdown the same, um, the ESV basically breaks verse 8 from the King James in half so that there is at least a verse 7 in the ESV, okay? So that's that's where this there's a big, big textual variant here. Um, that's another topic for another day. If you ever want to talk about textual criticism, all that, we can spend some time doing it. Um, I have a functional understanding of it, but I am no expert in it by any means. Having said that, um, let's go with what the ESV says because it's, it's the way it renders it is the one that has the most um, certain textual support behind it. And so we're going to use that as our basis to discuss this verse very quickly. Um, verse 6 says, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. Um, and the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. These three agree. Uh, if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he is born concerning his Son. OK, um, so there are three witnesses that are applied here um, to the um, uh, to the to the person of Jesus Christ. They are the spirit of the water and the blood. Now, what are those three things? Well, uh, the first one, I don't have uh, any any question about because it just says there the verse right before it, the spirit is truth or the spirit is the truth. So that is, you know, sometimes I've, I, I have this idea when you come to the word spirit, don't always think Holy Spirit. And I also will tell you that when you're reading the context, make sure you pay attention to the, 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 the nomenclature that is used to describe the spirit. Here it is described as, or he is described as the spirit of the truth, or at least the spirit is the, spirit is the truth. Okay, my spirit, the human spirit is not the truth. The Holy Spirit is. Uh, he is the spirit of truth. And so I don't have any, any problem here understanding uh, that he is the uh, um, he he is the he being here the Holy Spirit who bears testimony to Jesus. Uh, same kind of language Paul uses is that um, great is the mystery. That First Timothy three sixteen. Uh, it's either first or second Timothy. I think it's First Timothy three sixteen. Um, that the where he is. In fact, let's go over and turn over there real fast just to make sure I'm not not wrong about it. Um, if it's not First Timothy three sixteen. Yeah, there it is. Um, great, great is the mystery. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Same kind of um, message there. Um, the water. Um, I, I, I would tend to think the water there is the the water of his baptism, uh, where where the voice came from heaven, this is my beloved son, that would be the testimony of God, is greater than the testimony of men. 
God testified um, there that he is uh, that he is the Son of God. Um, and then the blood. I mean, there's two possibilities for blood. Uh, one that he was made in all points like his brethren, uh, first for Hebrews chapter two, or it could just be the blood of the cross, uh, the death, burial, and the resurrection. Um, I'm good with either. I think um, I do believe the um, the, uh, the 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 uh, Romans chapter three that he has put forth Christ to be the propitiation for our sins, um, and so the uh, the resurrection as it is often pointed to, you know, throughout the sermons of the book of Acts, what, what, what testimony is used, what evidence is used to provide the testimony about the Christ. It's often, it's only, well, it's not often, it is throughout the book. It's, in, it's always the resurrection, which is where, of course, the blood is shed. And then, you know, he, and so on, raised, raised up by the glory of the father. So um, Holy Spirit here, probably his water baptism here, Matthew chapter three, and then my guess would be probably the blood of the cross followed by the resurrection here. And these are the three that all provide the testimony. Uh, the spirit said he was the son of God. The, the, uh, that same testimony is provided by God at his, at his, um, uh, at, at his baptism. And, you know, as he said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down that I might take it up again. So his predictions of the, of the death, his death and his subsequent resurrection all of these three three things provide testimony to um, the one that is that is that is the Christ, the testimony that he's born concerning his son. Um, that that's my shot at it, Travis. I, I, it's not one I've spent a lot of time trying to flesh out all of the different um, possible meanings of it. But uh, I, I'm you know that's one of those things I'm I'm comfortable with that until somebody find, shows me a way that I shouldn't be comfortable with that. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you for the question. Um, let me just see if there's anything else. Um, I, I saw one from Gita up there that I don't have time to get to. I'll try to remember to get that for you tomorrow, Gita. Hopefully you'll be here. Um, um, I don't encourage others to study as part of the Christian life. If somebody help me remember to do that tomorrow if Gita is not there. Uh, but uh, we'll get to that one tomorrow because I don't have time to do that justice today. Um, let me just scroll through here and see what we have in terms of comments. Um, 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 here I go, here I go, here I go. I'm scrolling through, scrolling through, scrolling through. Um, most of that, I mean, a lot of good comments back, back and forth with each other. And some of those, uh, um, you know, back to me, I think as well, but I think most of those we've at least looked at on, on some level as we were talking through it today. So I, so far, um, so far, pretty good. Uh, oh, now Travis says in the King James, if you could. Well, I just messed that up. I didn't see that, sir. <laughs> um, um, in the King James on on that passage. Um, um, I'm going to say this real quick. Verse 7 in the King James reads, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. And then there are three that bear witness on the earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. These three agree in one. Um, what the King James has here in, in verse number seven is a truth statement. Uh, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the, the, Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Um, so that is, I don't have any problem with that rendering. Um, I, I, but I, from everything I have read, um, you know, when, let me say this, when, when you come to a, disputed text, the textual critics will grade uh, the support of a verse with letter grades. Just And I, I think it's just like, a, uh, if I remember correctly, it's been, it's been a few years since I've had my uh, general biblical introduction uh, classes. But if I'm not mistaken, they actually give it a letter grade for the support. And I think it's A, a to F, just like a, a um, uh, your, your report card in school type grade. And if I remember correctly, uh, the the lowest grade that they can give a a, a verse uh, in terms of the textual support behind a verse is here in all of the New Testament, and that's why none of the new translations have it. Um, now, likely what happened uh, in a situation like this 
is that the copyist who was copying it, just as we take notes in our Bible, they would sometimes take notes in the margins of, of manuscripts. And over the years, they sometimes those notes get incorporated into the text. And likely that's what happened here or something of that nature. Um, and those words simply got incorporated into a text. Now, is there anything wrong with this verse? No, nothing wrong with it because it's true. The Father, the Word, and the, and the Spirit are in heaven, and they they have each in their own way provided testimony, provided record about the about about the about the Christ, and they are one, and they agree in their testimony. So I don't have any problem with this verse at all, but it just really has almost no textual support behind it, other than the Textus Receptus. That's about it. Um, and most of the, as as the note from the New King said name said, most of the verses. Most of the manuscripts don't have it, so it probably does not belong here in this portion of uh, of First John. But it doesn't teach false doctrine; it doesn't change anything. So it, it's it's no great it's no great problem having the verse there. It's just the evidence doesn't support that it exists. So uh, in terms of what I in terms of my thinking on the matter, I don't allow verse seven as it is as, as it is recorded in the King James. To have any impact on me and what my thought is about verse number eight. Um, so I don't know if that's what you meant or not, but that's um, that would be my my quick answer to it. Um, um, so yeah, that, that'll wrap us up on that. Um, um, there we go. Um, so we will come back here, and as Travis had pointed out uh, earlier, uh, today he makes our number one hundred. Um, on um, study of the book of Romans. Actually, it doesn't, Travis. It's actually 99. I don't remember about three weeks ago when I was having some of those post-COVID symptoms, I only did one hour of the program. And I shut it down after the first hour. I wasn't feeling very good. And there was some construction going on in the unit behind me. And I shut off the second hour of the program. So I'm actually one lesson behind on Romans than I am on from the deep end. But it should be hour 100. It's actually, I think, technically hour 99. Anyway, let's go ahead and wrap it up, and we will be uh, back here, wrap this hour up, and we will be back here in just a few minutes to continue uh, our study, and we will open up Romans chapter 13 together today. So sit tight, and we will be right back with you shortly.
Welcome back, everybody. We will pick up here in the second hour of this program with our study of the Book of Romans. We're going to be in Chapter 13 uh, today. And as I was saying in the uh, very open of the program today, what a fitting day to uh, be studying this great chapter. Um, monumental um, day, monumental events going on here in our country. I haven't seen any updates this morning. Um, if it's still the mess, the 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 um, reports that came out late last night, if they're still valid and 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 all of that, hopefully they are, and hopefully the uh, you know I don't know that that leak was put out for any good result. I think probably by was put out by people that were trying to make sure that the news got out before the Supreme Court made its final decision. Uh, it is my understanding that um, these drafts are circulated. Are written and then circulated so that the other justices can review them and sometimes change their vote or switch switch sides to um, um, before the final vote gets out. And it's my understanding the theory is that this leak was done by those who want to make, to put pressure on the courts to uh, flip and not overturn uh, the the the. Um, um, decision that purport, purportedly is going to be made. Hopefully the five justices that, again, purportedly are on the side of, of making this fundamental change to, to our culture, um, hopefully they will stand firm and this report will go forward. But what an appropriate text to have in front of us um, today uh, as we begin a study of Romans 13 as it relates to how a Christian interacts with government. And that's going to be a, a wonderful thing to look at. Hey, let me stop real quick. Uh, Marlon, I see you in the in the comment section. And brother, I owe you an apology. I completely forgot to get back with you, man. And you sent me like three messages. And I was actually on my own Facebook feed last night. And I saw you had posted to my wall la or about four days ago, four, five, six days ago. And brother, I for completely forgot to get back with you. So sometime today, man, I'm going to reach out to you. And we, we will have that conversation if you still need it. But uh uh, I have the attention span of a gnat, so that happens a lot. I'm sorry, it happens a lot more than it ought to, um, but um, I'll, I'll try to try to get try to get to you this afternoon if I can. So, having said that, let's turn our attention to uh, to uh, Romans 13 together. Um, first paragraph is really that as it's broken down in the ESV. First paragraph is what we're going to be talking about probably for the most of the time today. Um, I'm going to start by reading it. Let's just get the whole text in front of us. Uh, because the, the actual point by point is, is I, don't, I don't suppose it's actually that that technical. It's really just a matter of taking a first century text and making an application into our, in our culture. That, that's, that's the big thing here. Uh, so I want to read it. I want to spend some time making sure we understand why Paul would put this here and what was so significant about this, this passage, particularly within a first century context. And then I'll spend the rest of the time that we're going to be on this on this on this text, um, really trying to understand it in a in a modern context. Okay, so let's just read it together uh, and and make sure we've got it on the table. The first seven verses of chapter thirteen read this way: Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists God, what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to a good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear uh, of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, uh, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your, your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to God to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay all to pay to all what is owed them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor unto whom honor is owed. Okay. So uh there is within this text, obviously, an endorsement of the institution of government. Um and I have heard it's oft said that there are three divine institutions. Uh, there is government, there's the church, and there's the home. Um, I suppose that's a, a good enough breakdown. I've never really thought about it enough to, to say whether I would agree wholeheartedly with that as their fourth. I don't know, but 
that the government is certainly something. The idea that there would be governance among the people of the world um, is, is a legitimate thought that God understood would exist. Okay. Um, those governments, this text affirms, have been instituted by God. Uh, I don't see any reason to believe, uh, not from any of the studies I've done in terms of the original language, or just an, uh, the the application of this passage um, uh, in, in into into specific examples to say that the individuals of government are of necessity uh, personally appointed by God. That does not seem to be the point here. Uh, is it the case that there have been individuals in in world history that um, have been specifically selected by God? Yes, that is the case. We just saw one back, back a few chapters in Romans chapter 9, where God says about Pharaoh, for this cause, I rose him up. I needed him in that position. Obviously, Saul, first king of Israel. David, the second king of Israel. Jeroboam, the first king of Israel. All specifically selected by God. Maybe you could make the case of that Cyrus, as he is called by name in Isaiah 44 and 45, maybe Cyrus as well. But in general, there is not, as far as I can tell, any biblical evidence that God picks specific individuals to sit on seats of authority in specific nations. The names that we just went through each played a part in furthering the, the mystery of Christ, the God, the, the, the eternal purpose in completing or, or, or bringing the world to the fullness of time. In those instances, God not only picked leaders, God picked everybody, okay? God picked Noah, God picked Abraham, and then Isaac and Jacob. And so to fulfill those purposes, he picked Jeremiah, he picked Daniel and Isaiah. He individually selected people to move the plan along to bring us to the fullness of time. But that's all with Israel or dealing with nations or, or people like Cyrus or like Pharaoh who had a direct impact upon Israel. During all that period of time, there were people living in mainland China, or what we know as mainland China. Did God pick any of their rulers? There were people living in the subcontinent of India, I'm sure. Did God pick any of their rulers? And so on. You go throughout all of the ancient world, there were people in all these different places. And as far as we have any evidence whatsoever, God did not pick um, individual people to rule those nations. Now, if he did, I, I suppose he could have. I'm saying we don't have any evidence of it. There's no way that we could prove that he does. I do not believe this statement is saying that though the individuals, for, for example, you know, in, in 2008, was Barack Obama handpicked by God to be over the United States? I don't think so. Was Donald Trump handpicked by God in 2016? I don't think so. Was Joe Biden handpicked by God in, in, in 2020? I don't think so. Is it possible that they were or one of them was? Sure, sure, possible. Can't prove it. No evidence whatsoever. And I do not believe that's the point of this text. The point of this text is that governing authorities, okay, have been instituted by God. I think the old King James says ordained by God. The concept of governance among us is a biblical concept. Okay, God wants there to be rules. And since therefore God wants there to be govern, excuse me, governance and rules among us, whoever resists those authorities resists that which God has appointed and will come under judgment. Notice this, by the way, at this point, this text is not stating something about Christians. This statement is generally true for all people. If you are an evildoer, not a Christian, and you resist the authorities of government, Guess what's going to happen? You're going to get punished. Absolutely. Whether you're a Christian or not. And so that's the point. The 
Paul says, rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no, would you have no fear uh, over the one that is in authority? Then do what is good. Okay. Then do what is good, and you will receive that, that, that approval. For he is God's servant. If you do wrong, you should be afraid. He does not bear the sword in vain. Just as an aside, right here, uh, this seems to be an implicit endorsement of, um, of, of the government's right to end people's life, of capital punishment, we would call it. Um, God certainly used capital punishment throughout the time of his time with the Jews and seems to suggest that governments have the right to do it here. Um, if it's not an endorsement, it is certainly at, at the very least a very pragmatic statement that says, you know, when they come for you, uh, it's going to work. <laughs> so maybe, maybe it's just pra pragmatic. I don't think it is. I think this statement is stating that the government has the right to go so far, so far as to uh, actually execute uh, some form of capital punishment. And so in that sense, he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath upon the wrongdoer. All right. Um, therefore, you should be in, 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 in subjection. You will avoid, avoid God's wrath. You'll also live in good conscience. And then we get to the part about paying taxes and all, all of us love that portion of it. Well, let's just start with the first five verses for now. Why would Paul be writing this? Well, remember who his audience has been. His audience, except for the end of, end of 11, end of 12, his audience for the majority of this book has been Jewish. He's writing it in AD 58, AD 60. A lot of people believe he's writing it from Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi when he is imprisoned there. Other, other ideas, but let's just go with that for a moment. What's going on in Israel right now or right then? Well, the seeds of Israel's rebellion against Rome are being sowed. Uh, Titus eventually, uh, not Titus, excuse me, Vespasian, eventually moves against Israel in the mid-60s AD. I think it's like 64 or so the conflict begins. So we are just three or four, maybe five years away from the nation of Israel rising up in revolt against Roman authorities. All right? Um, this, to me, sounds a lot like portions of the book of Hebrews, where this admonition not to fall back into this, we would call it nationalism, uh, zealotry might be another word for it. You know, there was actually a sect of the Jews that we would call the zealots, uh, who were, you know, ex extremely patriotic and wanted to get rid of Roman rule. As persecution begins to build from the church, they are in a, in a world in which the Jews are also rising up in rebellion against Rome. The temptation would be for Christians, either actively or at least passively, to join in with that thought or with, that, with, the, with those actions. You need to add this thought to it, though. Can't help but notice the doctrine that was present in 2 Thessalonians. Apparently, some believed that the coming of Christ was imminent to the point that they were ceasing to work. And Paul has to tell them, if a man will not work, neither shall he eat. They were becoming lazy. The, the admonition not to be busybodies in other people's affairs present throughout the writings of Paul. There was a temptation apparently growing more broadly as you read through the New Testament of Christians turning back to that, to, 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 or, or Christians turning to a, a rebellious disposition under the authority of the Roman Empire. What Paul is telling them here, and as I said, as we closed last week, or, la or yesterday rather, looking at the last chapter, all of this, all of these enemies that you're talking about here, all the people that are persecuting you, okay, some of them are Jewish, 
because the church went through that in the book of Acts. Some of them are Roman. This patient endurance of tribulation, which I again take to be the great tribulation of Matthew 24. All of this was beginning to unfold in their lives. And his admonition to them is, when you find these people who are persecuting you, do not return evil for evil. Rather, live peaceably as much in as much as you can. Live peaceably. That includes the government. The government here, specifically, that ultimately controlled by Rome and, and controlled by the Caesar. Obviously, there's local governments and all that as well. But you be in a you would be in subjection to them, because the goal here is not a revolution. We are not seeking to overturn either Judaism or the Roman Empire in the name of Jesus Christ. My kingdom, he says, is not of this world. And so he says, do not do that. Okay? Don't do that. Because, again, that would be the temptation. To stand and to fight in the name of Jesus because the church is being persecuted. The answer is, is not to stand and fight in the name of Jesus because the church is being persecuted. The answer to the problems you're having right now, to the pain that you're suffering right now, is not a holy war. Do not turn Christianity into some kind of political, militaristic campaign. You stay in subjection to the governmental authorities because your goal is to live peaceably with all if at all possible. The best path for doing that is under the governments that be. So that, that's the thought. Now, let's broaden that out some, though. I have at least a bit of a disagreement with a lot of what I've heard brethren say over the last couple of years as it relates to, obviously, all the stuff that's gone through, all the different regulations and, and mandates and stuff that have come down. Okay? Let me examine, let me tell you why I have, I disagree with how I've heard some people use this text. I mean, I, I have I have heard people use this text to say that, essentially, if you're a Christian, civil dissent should not be within your within your scope. Unless it, unless it actively violates the law of God, you cannot refuse any regulation that comes down from government. I don't think that's the point of this text. I don't think the point of this text is in any way trying to, to restrict or curtail your civil and, 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 and the, the civil response and the response and, 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 uh, and uh, um, opportunities, uh, liberties of a citizen seems to be trying to do it on a collective church, Christian level. Do not rise up and, and revolt against government. You do this. Let God have vengeance. So we are dealing here with God's judgment. I would believe this is talking about a national judgment on the nation's which are, um, uh, uh, are are persecuting uh, ultimately persecuting Christians and so on. To take this te to take this text and apply it universally seems to me it would be at least a little bit problematic, because there are general truths stated here that are not always true, and that's very easily demonstrated. For example, verse number three says. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Are you sure? Are you sure that's universally true? Is that always true? Not really. Not really at all. Um, within our recent memories, um, uh, go back to to to, to uh, 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 mid twentieth century Germany. 
I'm not going to use the name of their party because apparently certain social platforms don't like it when you use that word that starts with N and ends with A-Z-I. Um, but go back to that. Okay. Were rulers are, are, are always a terror or to bad conduct in that setting? No, no, they very much went the other direction. They very much went the other direction entirely and encouraged other people to do the same. Well, I'm not going to be subject to that because that's a violation of things that I know to be right. Telling all my neighbors, outing people of certain eth 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 ethnicities and, and trying to get them arrested and so on, not going to do that. The principle of civil disobedience, based upon the principles of truth, is not invalidated by this text. This is a general statement of truth. Rulers are not a terror to good, but to bad, until they aren't. Sometimes. A despot gets in place, and that despot is act actively trying to be a, to be a terror to people who are trying to live right. Are you saying that you have to say, stay in submission to that ruler unless you actively have to violate your Christian faith? I mean, what if it's the case that you, you could um, just not? report on your neighbors. You could sit passively by and not participate in the rounding up of, of, of let's just say, Israelites in the mid-20th century in Germany. Maybe you're not actively handing them in, but you just passively sit there, not resisting the government, but, well, wait a minute. Do you have no obligation as a as as a person of morality to say no? This isn't right. We should stop doing this. The law of our land has been. We just talked about it in the opening opening this hour. The law of our land has been the 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 killing of 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 of, of um, uh, infants in the womb. That's been that's been the law of the land. Well, you said okay. Well. I'm, I'm not going to actively oppose that. I'm going to sit because I have to be in subjection. No, that needs to be opposed. That needs to be opposed. Moral voices need to speak on these matters. Well, I, I, can't, I can't join the protest because I wouldn't be in subjection to government. Why not? I think this, this issue is perhaps a bit more complex than that. You would have to go far as far back to as even the founding of this country. There was an active declaration of, of, of severance of independence from a governing authority. So when you read the Declaration of Independence, do you read a document that is inherently sinful because citizens of a kingdom said, we, we are no longer recognizing the, the rule of, of your nation over us, and we are going to become self-governing? Did they or did they not have the right to do so? Does this verse take away the right of any person of faith from having any discord and disagreement, and so therefore perhaps a, uh, 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 a, a, a desire to separate themselves from? I don't think that's the point. Don't think that's the point at all. What was going on in the first century is that a nation state, the Jews, the Jewish nation, was on the precipice of an armed revolution against Rome with the intent of reestablishing the theocracy of Israel, independent of Rome. The corollary to that would be Christians rising up in armed conflict against Rome to set up a quote-unquote church-led nation. That would be the response. The church is going to take up arms to defend itself against Rome. That seems to be the problem here. 
I don't know that if you apply this text universally, you're going to come to conclusions that um, are, are going to be consistent with other passages of Scripture. That's all I'm saying. The general statement, the general truths here is that government is not to be resisted. In general, government on the whole is a blessing to people who want to do right because it keeps law and order. It provides peace. It provides the ability to do this, to live peaceably with all until it doesn't. And when it doesn't, I'll let your conscience help you figure out what you do there. We know the concept, I hope, from Acts chapter 4, that we ought to obey God rather than man. We can cite any number of examples of people not coming back uh, uh, or not 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 following uh, the laws of the land. Somebody in the, in the comment section, Elaine, um, says that the midwives in Moses' day, great example, act of civil disobedience, right? So the idea that you have to follow them blanketly is not what this text is saying. Ultimately, when somebody disobeys God, when they when the law commands you to disobey God, then obviously this does not apply. You ought to obey God rather than man. Now, you get down to the end of this text because you should pay your taxes and revenue to whom revenue is due. All right. If you don't think that the if 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 um, all of a sudden the the um, government raises the the top marginal rate from what is it right now thirty six thirty seven thirty eight percent if let's say it's thirty eight percent if they move they move the top marginal rate from thirty eight percent to forty seven percent well guess what you're going to be paying forty seven percent because they they have the right. To, to, to pay taxes, to declare taxes from you. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be happy about it. And as a citizen, you should probably get involved in the political process. If you don't like those rates, get involved in the political process and try to overturn it. Should you lead an armed revolution against it? Probably not. Probably not. Okay? So there's, there's a lot of things that government can do that we may not like that have um, no impact in terms of Bibli in terms of the Bible. As a Christian, my faith should not have any imp any problem in following those. That doesn't mean that even though I am a Christian, I cannot take part in the political process and protest that, seek to lobby against it, seek to overturn it, and so on. I have the right, particularly in a, in a, in a democratic republic, I have the right to protest. I have the right to free speech. I have a lot of things that are recognized in, in, in particularly in the United States. I have a lot of things that I am allowed to do and can do. And the fact that I'm, I am a Christian does not strip away from me the right that I have to do that. That's not what this text is about. Now, the sticky part gets to be right there in the middle. Because, as I, as, as I said earlier, there are sometimes rules, regulations, whatever, are, are put down that um, don't actively um, cause you to disobey a rule of God. But there might be some point of conscience, some point of scruple, which is coming up in chapter 14, um, that um, uh, following them might cause you some problems. Uh, for example, the uh, but we went through with everybody getting jabbed over the last year or so, 18 months or so. I'm not going to tell you what I did. I'm not going to tell you why I did it. It's none of your business. Okay? But I know Christians on both sides of that issue. And I've also heard Christians say that essentially the argument being that if the government says you've got to get jabbed, then you have to obey every ordinance of man and go get jabbed. Well, I've heard other Christians say, well, no, I don't have to do that, and they give their host of reasons why. Um, some of them, I, I'm not sure those claims are right or not, but 
they come along and, and say a whole bunch of other stuff about them. Well, who's right on that matter? Well, fortunately, we have Romans 14 in the next chapter. Romans 14 in the next chapter. But when we started shutting down churches two years ago, I, I heard people appeal to this text in, in so many different ways. It just really started to, 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 to at least to bother me on some level that um, either the text was being ignored or the text was being applied as if, as a, as a, if you will, a trump card to any any kind of dissent to uh, uh, to the actions that were being taken in 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 society. So the, the, there were, you know, I, on on either end of that the, the extremes of that spectrum, there were those that were just pretty much dismissive of this text altogether, and that's maybe maybe a little bit of a straw man, but largely dismissive of it. And on the other side, again, maybe a little bit of a straw man here, a little bit of a generalization. But there were some very heavy-handed brethren saying that, listen, if, if the government is saying this, if that's the rule, if that's the regulation, you have to follow it if you're a Christian. Well, there's a duality here. And I don't know that we do a very good job in dealing with the duality. I am a Christian at all times. But not everything I do is motivated by the fact that I am a Christian. Not everything I do is done as a representative and in the name of Jesus Christ. All right, just not. You know, I I, I subscribe to, to whatever uh, streaming services I do, not in the name of Jesus. I do it whichever one I want to watch. I mean, I just, I, I, I shop at a particular grocery store as opposed to another one because, not because Jesus said anything, but because, this one's closer or that one's got lower prices. There are a lot of decisions I make that have nothing to do with my faith. And I don't know that scripture prevents me from making use of those and that my, my faith somehow trumps any personal autonomy I have in those matters. Uh, Paul was very zealous of his, of, his, of his Roman citizenship and made use of it to his own personal benefit and to the benefit of the cross. Did both, um, you know, uh, got himself in front of Caesar eventually, caused himself on occasion to, to not to be beaten and so on, made use of his citizenship whenever it benefited him. Um, I think at least, and this is, I'm really completely up on my soapbox right now, but I believe at least part of the reason we're having the problems we're having, and not, not political problems, but cultural problems just the moral and cultural rot we have in our society right now is because we as Christians have been too disjointed and too disassociated from the world around us. We have not engaged enough. Um, listen, there, there is no way, there is no way it should have taken 48 years assuming what we heard this morning goes through. There is no way it should have taken 48 years to get what's going to be hopefully overturned here, overturned. Th this issue of, 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 of ending the life of, of, of babies has never been a winning issue. I, I've never, never believed that for a second that the actual majority of people understanding what is going on there actually, actually was something that people will sat back and go, yeah, that's fine. I mean, most of the secular democracies of Western Europe have been more restrictive on this issue than the United States has been for the last 50 years. Have you ever looked at the, at the laws of Western Europe on this topic? Many of them are much more stringent than what we have in our states and in, 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 in our country today. Many of them. Um, and those are secular. Don't even pretend to have any kind of, 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 of Christian, quote unquote, um, a component uh, uh, to their legal system. And they're more stringent on this than we are. 
No way. It should have taken us 48 years. I think it's 74 to 22, right? 48 years. No way. The only reason it took, the only reason it lasted that long is because a whole lot of Christians sat on their hands. A whole lot of Christians sat on their hands. We sat on our hands while the rot that's being taught in schools today. I mean, I saw, um, I saw a, um, um, images from a, a sex education book that they are putting in elementary schools. Um, I, I can't even describe it without being vulgar. I mean, it is, it is, it is, it is, it's, it's cartoon drawing, but it is, it is hardcore pornography in elementary school sex education books drawn. But it is hardcore. I mean, there there is actual insertion of various orifices in the body drawn to appeal to elementary school kids. And, and standard issue for them, they're trying to get it in. It's part of a standardized curriculum trying to get into public schools. How does it get that far? Well, because we don't get engaged. We don't get involved. We sit back, afraid to be political, I guess. I don't know. But we sit back and we let it happen. This has an impact. It's not as if that's happening in the world and it's not happening to our kids at church. It is. There's not a safe place any longer. There's not. There, there is simply not a safe place any longer. Your school district's no different than anybody else's. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm in the Bible Belt. Don't care. Don't care. You are not, your kids are not safe. And because we have sat back and allowed our institutions to be taken over. Because as Christians, we have this idea that our citizenship is in heaven and we'll just let the world take care of itself. God is in control. God is in charge. Okay, great. God was in charge of Israel and they started sacrificing their babies to Molech. God was in charge. God was in charge when they built a bull, stuck his arms out in the image of Moloch, kindled a fire in the middle of, I believe it was supposed to be a bronze um, idol, kindled a fire in the heat in the belly of that hollow bull and let it heat up and essentially burned their babies on the arms of that on the arms of that altar. Okay? God was in charge then. They did that while God was in charge. And that was Israel. Why? Because good people did nothing. Good people didn't resist what was going on around them. It is not always the case that rulers are a terror only to those that do bad. Sometimes, and maybe more times than we want to admit, Maybe more times than we want to admit, rulers are a terror to those that try to do good. Now, under an empire and a Caesar, your options are limited. You don't have the right of public protest. You don't have the right of assembly. You don't have the right to petition your government. You don't have the right of free speech. And in those instances, your only option is to pick up arms in the name of the cross and start a holy war. That's what the Jews were doing. And Paul is saying, don't do that. But good people, there are a lot of steps between picking up arms and starting a holy war and sitting back passively until like the frog in the kettle, we are boiled alive 
and wake up one morning and realize we've lost our culture and we can't turn on the television. We can't go to a movie. We can't send our kids to school. We can't, we can't engage in any social construct without abject rot and moral, moral nihilism at best being taught to our kids. There are a lot of steps between huddling in our congregations and in our churches or starting an armed conflict in in a holy war in the name of the Lord's church. A lot of steps in between those two things. Some of the greatest advances in our culture were created by good people rising up in social protest, civil protest. I don't know why we're not more engaged. The church lives inside a community. The church lives inside the reality of a culture. It simply does. We need to be more engaged, not less engaged. We need to be more engaged, not less engaged. Then I see I see people in, in, in the comment section talk about homeschooling as I talk about kids in public school. Great, my my, my daughter's homeschooling her kids right now, and and that's great. That that's a solution. But you know what that doesn't do? That doesn't help the culture. Homeschool your kids all you want to. Guess what? Culture's still riding around them. There are a whole lot more kids in public school. Still being taught the same same crud, the same stuff. They are. And what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do with college level? It just I'm not gonna I'm not gonna throw people under the under the uh, under the bus here. But if you haven't heard what happened at Oklahoma Christian just a couple of mo- a couple of months ago, I think it was at this point. You need to need to need to dig around and find out what happened at Oklahoma Christian. Okay. Stuff going on in our Christian colleges as well. Just abject trash being taught in some of our Christian colleges. Now, as far as I know, the Bible department at OCU is great. The Bible department at Freed is great. And then we've got a few other places like that. The Bible department's great. Do you know what your liberal arts professors are teaching at our Christian universities? What's the philosophy? What 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 is the political science? What's the literature teaching? What are their views on these matters? I'm not sure we're as safe as we think we are. I don't think we're as safe as we think we are. Homeschooling is a great choice. Big fan of it. I'm glad my daughter's doing it. It's not a solution. It's a band aid. Not a solution. You know, even, and, and and I need to heed my own words here, but your schools, even if your kids aren't in them, you're still paying for them. How many of us have been to a, a, a school board meeting? How many of us have, 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 have actually tried to stop the incursion of the, the, you know, this stuff into our schools? Because I just about guarantee you, that, uh, that 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 first grade, second grade, third grade teacher that you have probably graduated from a state university. Probably just that few years ago. And they're probably a knucklehead. They're probably crazy. Probably crazy. I'm still old school, man. I'm still I'm still old school. If I had a kid in, in kindergarten right now and that kid had a male teacher, I would my eyebrow would go straight up as far as I could get it, and I'd I'd look that dude over seven times to, to, till Tuesday. What what does a what why on earth does a 24, 24 year old man want to teach kindergarten? Mm-hmm. See, I'm still uh I'm still old school. <laughs> uh, oh, but I, I digress. Anyway. Um, this passage, this passage needs to be left within a particular context. 
that context is an age in which people were about to start a holy war. The zealots of Israel were about to rise up against Rome. Some of the Christians likely were tempted to follow them. To the point that Paul says in the chapter just before it, in the midst of the great tribulation, do not seek to avenge yourselves. God will take care of it. It's part of his plan, part of prophecy. If you've read the book of Revelation, and you will shortly, because it's going to be written not very long from now, when you read it, you'll understand more. God, the God of peace, is going to do this. Let him handle it. And so, therefore, don't resist. Stay in line. Live peaceably. The government you're under currently is sufficient for you to live a quiet and peaceable life. To apply this text universally without any other consideration is going to be at best problematic. We live in a different time. We have a different governmental system. We have more rights acknowledged under our legal system than any Roman citizen ever had. The idea that the church can exist in this world without at the same time having to engage this world is, is, is short-sighted. If we do not engage them in the political and cultural realm, they will engage us in the spiritual and religious realm before long. And that's what we've let them do. We've let them have sway in, the, in all of our institutions, in government, in academia, in, in, in culture, in pop culture, entertainment, sports. We've let them have held sway in all of these areas, and we're paying for it. Didn't happen in a vacuum. The, the, the absolute nut jobs that have control of all of our institutions now, that are, that are teaching all those things that we see, did not happen in a vacuum. They gained, they gained prominence while good people did little, did nothing. And we're paying for it now. And if we're going to stop it, we're going to have to get outside of our church building. Maybe we lay down the hat of the Christian for a minute and we pick up the hat of a citizen but not to resist this stuff, not to seek to, 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 to help our culture change is a short recipe for allowing the church to be very negatively impacted. We are privileged beyond, beyond measure that we have the right to stand up without starting a holy war. And we should. We want to help the church we should. And frankly, if we did, it would be easier to convert people to Christ. If we could highlight in our culture the absolute lunacy of what's being said among us, it would be a lot easier to talk to people about Jesus. So, that's my soapbox for today. Um... Let me finish up. Well, let me go ahead and just mention this last. I think I mentioned it some, but I want to mention this here at the end. Um, obviously, um, you get to the very specific issue of the, of the paying of taxes. I actually know some Christians who stopped paying their taxes at one point because they thought the uh, the Constitution did not allow the, uh, the uh, federal government to tax individuals, only to tax the states, and that was a, it was a thing for a while. Uh, I, would not, I would not suggest doing that. that that's going to be a bad move. First of all, don't think it's biblical. Government has the right to tax. We may not like it, but they have the right to tax. Taxes need to be paid. Um, revenue paid. Respect needs to be given. Honor needs to be given. Um, and that that remains true as well. Um, that remains true as well. I mean, that, it's not that you can't ever say something negative about, about a, 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 a political person. You certainly can Need to from time to time. Um, but the general principle is true. Uh, people that are serving, assuming they are serving, as as, as described here, as a, a servant of God, 
honor to whom honor is due as a principle all through scripture parents children parents children to parents of, of members of a church to uh, uh, elders that rule well double honor should be given and of citizens within it within a, within a nation we need to be people who show respect as um, a, as much as we can great little text here um and we, I could probably carry on about that for days but important thing in my mind is, is first of all just make sure it stays stays within its context and understand that what we're dealing here with is is a is a is some admonition given um directly to um um uh directly to um uh, some people dealing with a, a time of rebellion that ultimately at least first was led by the jews and not to take up arms and participate in it as i said passingly earlier there's a lot of similarity between this text and the advice given here as is given kind of throughout the book of hebrews as well uh, don't don't turn down that path again. Uh, Nakia asks, where can I, where can she find that uh, Oklahoma Christian story I mentioned? Um, I would look on the Christian uh, Christian Chronicle website. I, I believe Christian Chronicle did a did a write up about it um, a couple months ago. Would be my guess. I, I'm assuming they have one. Um, if not, you probably just Google it in general and find it. Um, it and uh, yeah, so just need to read about it. And, and my, actually, the uh, the the stuff that was done in the class, if I remember correctly, was not actually by the professor. It was by a um, a, um, a a visiting lecturer that came in to do a class. Um, but actually, the thing that caught my eye about the story was not so much that it happened, because that stuff can't happen. You never know. You bring somebody in, you never know exactly what they're going to say. Um, the thing that caught my eye was actually the the in the story that I read about it was the was the response of students and other people to what o, 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 OCU did. Um, uh, what OCU did, I think they ended up firing the guy, the the teacher that brought in the professor that brought in the lecture. I believe he they ended up firing the guy, um, which was probably the right move. But the response of the students at a Christian university, quote unquote to that action was the thing that was troubling to me most um, because they didn't sound any different. They didn't sound a lick different than the things you hear 20 something year olds these days say at, at, at state universities, uh, that their, their views on these, on these matters as, as, as uh, on the issues that were being talked about. I, I, what I was reading, I couldn't tell, I couldn't tell you the difference saved my life. So anyway, that's where we are today. Thank you all for tuning in, being a part of the program today. A little more, a little more preachy than normally on this on on this in this hour, but um, hope you all found some benefit in it. Um, we have Truth Tuesday coming up here in just a moment at the ten o'clock hour, and then do not forget that tonight we have um, a second uh, um, uh, um, instance of uh, Memphis School of Preaching guys here with us, and uh, Epifano Carraza. That's what I'm going with until he tells me actually how to pronounce it tonight. We'll be our uh, our speaker this evening. Off to a great start last night. Raised nearly $200 for the uh, scholarship fund at Memphis. Looking forward to doing another good night with them tonight. Um, so I need to uh, I need to hush so Truth Tuesday can have the room. So I will do that. And Lord willing, uh, I'll see you back here tonight. And then, of course, tomorrow morning. And we will pick up Gita. I'll try to remember to get your questions to start the hour next uh, uh, tomorrow. And then we will go from there. So everybody, thank you once again. Uh, and we will see you back here tonight and then Northern Willing tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. for the next episode of From the Deep End. Until then, uh, go out, make your day great, and for God, everybody. Have a good day.